Psalm 19. You're going to see in just a moment why we're only going to be looking at this one psalm. Next week, God willing, as we gather together, we'll look at Psalm 20 and 21. But tonight we're looking at Psalm 19. And so this is a uh, psalm that is written by, by David. And so let's begin reading together here in Psalm 19 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 6, and we'll get into our study of Psalm 19. Psalm 19, a psalm of David, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 6. The psalmist writes, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them He has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end. There is nothing hidden from its heat. Now, as we look at this, I want to remind you of something that all of us already know, but I want to use this as a context and I want to use this as a foundation. Let me remind you that, that the psalmist David, King David, is also known as being a shepherd. And David, as a young shepherd, would spend many nights in the fields while he was caring for his sheep. And undoubtedly, as he would be out there in those beautiful evenings, he would look up to the, to the heavens. And because there were no street lights of any sort, it's just him and the natural illumination of the moon and stars, as he would be out there, he would begin to comp contemplate how great, how wonderful the heavens are. And he would see that as a demonstration of a designer. This is a man who is extremely gifted. David was not only a warrior king and a tremendous leader and general of his military, but he was also a very skilled vocalist, songwriter, and musician. And I've discovered that people with creative skills have a tendency of being able to describe things with such graphic detail, and they also sometimes can gain things that the ordinary person like, like me will really fail to see. All of us can, I think, appreciate art when we see it, and especially fine art. But David was the person as a creative master who would look up to the stars and would actually just begin to contemplate things beyond the fact that they're beautiful and glowing. But he would begin to think in terms of, of who, who made those stars. And so he would sit under the sky and he would wonder at the sun, the moon, and the stars. And the beauty and their splendor caused him to realize how insignificant he truly was. And what we see here, and I want you to see this as we divide the psalm, what we see here is really what would be called a nonverbal witness to the reality of a supreme creator. What we have here is a natural witness to the reality of a supreme creator. And God uses nature, and this is an important point, this is a very important point, God uses nature to draw your attention to the reality of the one who created all things. Nature can do that. The Bible tells us in, in the New Testament book of Romans, in chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He is saying that nature is a witness to a creator. That's what he's saying. He's saying that nature, the sun, the moon, the stars, nature is a witness to the creator. That's why in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25, God would say, To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of His might and the strength of His power, not one is missing. And so the, the nature, creation, is intended to draw our attention to the reality of the one who created all things. That's what he means when he says in verses 4 through 6 that their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. The sun rises, he says, like a bridegroom leaving his tabernacle or his tent. He's excited about being married, and therefore he rushes out. Or it looks like a champion runner who's running his course. 
And the point he's making is there's natural revelation, and the natural revelation cries out that there's the reality of a God. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 3, verse 4 said the same thing. He said, every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And so creation is intended to draw our attention to the Creator, not to worship creation, but to worship the one who created all things. And so the first six verses is speaking about the wonder of nature and the creation that should draw your attention to the reality that there is a God. Now, there have been men who have joined their wives when their wives have been giving birth, men who had no sense of religion, who upon watching the mystery of childbirth and seeing all that goes on in that have actually walked away saying, you know, this isn't just by, by accident. I mean, this is just... And it's the same thing that you find the psalmist saying, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. They walk away saying, this is amazing. That just, just a moment before, there's a baby in a womb, and then the baby separates, and here I am holding this, this ugly little thing that's mine. And, and as I'm doing that, it just causes me to realize that there's something greater than me. There's a plan that's beyond anything that I could ever come up with. And, and, and nature can do that. Nature can cause us to see that there's something greater than ourselves. But the fact of the matter is that nature cries out the reality of God, but is not itself a sufficient witness. You see, some are foolish enough to worship nature itself. And there are those who go out there and wonder at the power of, of the wind or the majesty of, of a, a tree or, or the beauty of, of an ocean. And they actually begin to worship the creation rather than the creator. And so Paul, again in Romans chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, says this about that. He says, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That's the heart of idolatry. And so they wonder at the beauty of a tree. They wonder at the majesty of the, the ocean and all of that. And they begin to worship the elements. And he says, rather than giving God the glory, the one who does all of these things, they have a tendency of giving the glory to that which was created. And so I want to develop something with you. One, I want to point out to you that nature, though it is a tremendous witness, is not sufficient to bring you to a knowledge of God. Though nature is tremendous in its ability to draw your attention to the grandeur, splendor, or whatever you might want to call it, the power and majesty that it possesses, but, but still it is, it is not alive. It is simply that which is a product of the one who created it, and therefore it's, it's, it's capable of drawing your attention like a sign, but is not capable of saving you. As a matter of fact, we know that Paul says in the book of Romans that there are two basic things that we have that, we, uh, that are used that help us to come to a knowledge of God. One is nature, and the other is conscience. And he says these two things are something that we possess and we have the ability to see through nature and also by the awareness of our own sinfulness or the things that we've done wrong, we have an awareness that there's something greater than ourselves which ought to draw us to a saving knowledge of the Creator God who gives to us salvation through Jesus Christ, you see. But just by going out and looking at the beauty of the moon or the sun or the stars is not sufficient for us to be saved. It is sufficient to draw our attention to something greater but it's not sufficient for us to be saved. Nature cannot save us. Nature, conscience, prophets, miracles, angelic visitations, and, and all are part of the process that God has used to draw our attention to Himself. He especially draws our attention to Himself through the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But He gives to us something that is necessary, something that we're going to be looking at in just a moment here in verses 7 through 11 especially, that is really, really important, and that is he's going to give to us uh, insight into how God can instruct us, and that comes through his word. Now, I wanted to share with you something, because as we've been seeing recently, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, is really drawing a lot of attention. There are numbers of people who are seeing the movie, and it's going to be in the multiple thousands. We already see that many, many thousands have already begun seeing the movie and all. And I believe that what the, the film is going to be used to do is to draw questions that need answers. 
People are asking questions concerning that. They're asking, did he really do that? And why did he do that? And, and, and was it as brutal as it appears and all? Uh, there are some who are saying, and I've read these comments, perhaps some of you have too, I've heard certain comments uh, about this where they're saying that uh, one in particular that comes to mind where this uh, particular person who was reporting on film, he was a film critic, was saying that he didn't believe that, uh, that Jesus went through that kind of passion, that no human being could have gone through that kind of passion. And the only reason that this person would say that is because he doesn't know the Word of God, and he obviously doesn't know history. Because uh, what Jesus is depicted of, uh, uh, as going through is, is not, in the film, is not as severe as what he actually did go through. I mean, they really, there's no way that you can actually show the amount of brutality that was foisted on the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but I say that to say this. Uh, I, how do I view the film? And, and I see it in this way. I see it as a tool to begin dialogue. I see it as something that people will see and then begin to ask questions. I see it as an illustration. I see it as something that is graphic. I see it as something that people will, will relate to emotionally. It'll give to them something to think about, to feel about. But the film in and of itself is not going to be sufficient to bring people to salvation because just seeing a, a movie is not enough because it's nature. It's almost like nature. It's, you see something graphically portrayed, but there's no explanation. And there are people who are asking right now, and some of you have heard this because I've been following this very carefully now, and reading various newspaper articles and reading different reviews and reading magazines about this, and I've been following this to see what's what's the you know the buzz about this and all. And there are people who are saying things relating to it, saying that... Uh, that uh, it, it's too brutal here or it doesn't have an explanation there. And I think that's part of what, what, what the, the genius of this film is all about. It's intended to cause people to ask questions. And as I've been sharing with you recently, I really believe that, that this is the kind of film that wouldn't really even need to be made if the pulpits of America were preaching the cross of Jesus Christ. Somebody today called uh, to every man an answer and, and asked the question there on K-Wave, to every man an answer, they asked the question of Pastor Brian Broderson, was the uh, crucifixion really necessary? Now, the cross is the heart. The cross is the heart of Christianity. When you study the book of Acts and you go through the preaching of the apostles there, you, especially Apostle Peter, when you begin to look at the beginning, the Apostle Peter would preach the cross. He would proclaim the cross of Jesus Christ and even went so far as to speak to his audience and say, you killed him. Because he wanted people to know that we were culpable, that we are responsible, that Jesus Christ died because of us. That's why in the film, when you see the nail and the hand holding the nail that is about to drive that nail into the hand of Jesus, that's why Mel Gibson is the one holding that nail. Because he wanted to illustrate the point that he is responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. So when people begin to say, who killed Jesus? The answer he's given is, we did. We did. Was the cross necessary? Absolutely. Because that's where God's love met man's sin. That's what Jesus Christ did. He died for us. That's the whole point. But when you're watching a movie, it isn't going to be graphically, for, at least in the sense of, of, of the gospel being portrayed clearly, you, you don't get the full message. Uh, what you see is you see some remarkable events and you see the death of Christ. But it, it's, the, it's the, the job of the church to preach the cross. That's what we do. That's what we're supposed to do. So... The way that I've responded to this is I see this as a work of art. And indeed, he took some artistic, um, you know, license in it. You know, much of the dialogue, much of the dialogue is, is Scripture. But as I saw it the second time, I realized that much of it is from tradition or, or just filler. And, and that's the way movies are. It isn't a clear portrayal of the gospel in the sense that preaching and opening the Word and declaring it is, you see. And so if there's any effect in this particular movie that I am praying for, it's that churches will be filled, not just on Sunday mornings, but that churches will be filled whenever the doors are open by people who want to know more about this one who died for them. Not just an emotional response to a movie that is graphic and brutal and causes you to say, he did that for me, and then to go on our merry way. Because I find it ironic in that uh, every season that, that some traditions uh, today celebrate, which is the Lenten season with Ash Wednesday and all, you know, uh, some of you remember that particular discipline that, that you went through and all. I, I, being raised a Catholic, remember the significance of the ashes and all. 
and, uh, and the words ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and, and how significant that was. It was to remind us that we were perishing and, and all of that. I remember that very well. But some people would give up things for 40 days, you know, as an act of mortification of the flesh. And so something that brings you pleasure, something that you enjoy, is something that you give up. For me, it was candy. It could have been anything for you. And, and because I enjoyed candy and all, I'd stop. And I'd say, this is an act of, of, of mortification of the flesh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deny myself certain pleasures for the next 40 days to remind myself of Jesus' death. And that's what was traditional in my faith as I was growing up. But, but once uh, Easter had come and everything was done, I'd go back to the old way of life. The old way of life. Because that was a seasonal holiness. And see, we don't need that. We don't need a seasonal holiness. We don't need a season where we are going to do our best. We need a daily walk with Jesus Christ. And so I see Mel's film as a tremendous, one of the tools that God is going to use to awaken millions of people. I find it interesting to note that many of the Hollywood stars and all that we see uh, on, on the movies and all are wearing T-shirts, you know, about Jesus being their homeboy now. And, and it's just kind of an odd, odd thing, you know. They're jumping on the Jesus bandwagon. But I'm praying, oh, I am praying, and I ask you to pray along with me, that the people who see these move, this movie will go to church on Sunday and hear a message that will cause them to realize that following Jesus is every day. And what he did on that cross was forever for us, to transform us and make us new. And that, that it's not just Sunday morning that I want to get into the Word of God. I want to get into the Word like we are tonight on a Wednesday night. I want to get in the Word on a Sunday night. I want to get in the Word on my daily devotions. I want to get in the Word with friends who love the Lord. My life needs to be different because of what He did for me. Now, nature will not cause you to do that. Nature can give to you a sense that there is something greater than me, but the Word of God tells you who that great one is. And that's what the Bible does for us, you see. And that's what we're looking at here in Psalm 19, especially as we look at verses 7 through 11. Let me read those verses. We'll get into it. He says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Uh, early in my Christian life, somebody put music to this particular portion of Scripture, and we used to sing this song when we were in Calvary Chapel very early, and we would sing them. I won't, I won't sing it to you, don't worry. But we used to sing this and what I want to do is I want to share with you how God reveals himself through his word. He's already spoken about the fact that the heavens declare the glory of God. But now he speaks concerning the law of God. And I'm going to take this apart. We're going to spend a few minutes looking at these few verses here. Let's begin at verse 7 where he says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. When he says the law of the Lord, he's speaking concerning the word of God. And the law of the Lord, he says, is perfect. That word perfect when he speaks concerning God's, God's word, that mean, it means that Scripture lacks nothing to be complete. He is saying that the word of God is a complete revelation of God's truth. When he says that the law of the Lord is perfect, he is saying that it is an unerring guide of conduct because it is complete and it is sufficient. And he is saying that the word of God is capable of ministering to every facet of your spiritual life. The Word of God is perfect. It can minister in every area of your life is the point he's making. And he says that there's an effect of the Word of God converting the soul. He's saying any broken life can be transformed by God's Word because the word convert there speaks of refreshing or reviving. He's saying to us that the law of the Lord is complete, lacking nothing, and refreshes your soul. He's saying that those who have been broken in life can come to God and he will refresh you. Like that woman who came to the Lord Jesus Christ, the woman who actually was brought to him, who was caught in adultery. That's recorded in John chapter 8. Oh, incidentally, in the movie with Mel Gibson, Catholic tradition holds that the woman caught in adultery was Mary Magdalene. 
That's Catholic tradition, but not Scripture. The Bible does not teach that. But that was Catholic tradition, and I saw that, and immediately I recognized her for who she was supposed to be. But the woman in, in, in John chapter 8 is left unnamed. She is not named there in that particular portion of Scripture. You see that in verses 1 through 11. She is not named. But we know that there was a woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. We know that religious leaders brought this woman to Jesus, and we know that those who were accusing her said that women like this, especially this woman, he's, they say, who was caught in the act of adultery, in the very act, they said, the law says that women like this, such are to be stoned. And that's when Jesus kneels down. You know the story. And he begins to write on the ground. Interestingly enough, that's the only place in the Bible, in the New Testament, that you ever see Jesus write anything. And what's interesting is it's not revealed what he writes. And so you have all of this supposition. What was it that he was writing? Was he writing the sins of those people there and they were beginning to look down and see it? What was he writing? Their names, those who had been with this woman, there are so many suppositions. We really don't know what he was writing. Perhaps he was writing the law that states that the woman who's caught in adultery is to be stoned along with the, the one that she was caught with. And obviously the man wasn't dragged to Jesus, only the woman, because they were using her as a guinea pig because they wanted to accuse him of something. And that's why the Lord Jesus just looks up and, and paraphrasing, says if you're without sin, then you'd be the first one to cast a stone at her. And he just bends down and continues writing. And as he's writing there in the on, the on the dirt, we know the story. Everybody begins to melt away. The Scripture says from the oldest to the youngest because the oldest had more to be accountable for than the youngest. They all dropped their stones there that they were going to use to kill the woman. And before you know it, they disappear. And then Jesus is left alone with the woman and he looks up at her and he basically says to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Because in order for her to be put to death, it required two witnesses. Where are your accusers? I have none, Lord. And we all know the famous words of Jesus after that. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. The word of God is sufficient to refresh you. His declaration, I'm not accusing you. I'm forgiving you. Now you go out and act as somebody who's been forgiven. Don't go back to your sin Flee from your sin and live as somebody who's been set free from it. I'm not going to accuse you. So that's what the Word of God does. It converts the soul. It revives. It refreshes the soul. He says in verse 7 here in chapter 19 or Psalm 19, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. When he says the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple, the word testimony speaks of Scripture being a divine witness. It bears testimony. So Scripture is a divine witness. And when he says that the testimony of the Lord is sure, that word sure means that it's reliable. It's immovable. In other words, the testimony of the Lord is worthy to be trusted because it reveals God's ways to us and imparts wisdom. Therefore, it can be trusted. And that's why all spiritual experiences must be tested against the Word of God. And all words spoken as from God need to be tested by the Word of God. So if somebody says, thus saith the Lord, then we open up the Word of God to see whether the Lord has said such and so. Because that's what it's for. It's, it's, it's capable of being the divine witness. And there's something that it does. Notice he says that it makes wise the simple. Now the word wise in this context speaks of uh, a person who is experienced in godly living. The Word of God gives to you understanding. In Psalm 119, verse 130, the entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. When Paul was writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15, he said to him, From childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So God's Word makes wise the simple. Now, that word simple, you might find interesting. In the original language, it speaks of the open-minded. In other words, the person who allows just anything to drop in their head. It speaks of the person who is naive or somebody who is not discriminating enough to close your mind to deception. 
Proverbs 14, 15 says, The simple believes every word, but the prudent man looks well to his going. So a person who is simple is a person who just buys into anything. If the guy opened the Bible and said it, it must be true. He asked me to send him some money. He needs it because his ministry is going down the tubes without my help. I better send him some money. And after all, he's had some remar remarkable experiences with God. I've shared this with you before about an individual who was speaking to a Bible teacher by the name of John MacArthur. And he said to John MacArthur, he said, John, I want you to know that every morning when I'm shaving, the Lord Jesus Christ comes and stands next to me as I shave, and we have a conversation. And he asked uh, John MacArthur, do you believe this? And, and John MacArthur's response was great. He says, no, I don't, but what scares me is I think that you do. And there are people who will say things that are just not even in Scripture at all, and the simple person, because they're not in the Word of God, will buy into it. That's why he's saying no. He says the Word of God makes you wise. It gives you discrimination. It gives you the ability to discern error from truth. And that's how you're going to know when somebody knocking on your door is lying to you or telling you the truth that comes from Scripture. And he says that's what the Word of God does. See, a tree can never do that for you. The, the sun, the moon, the stars can never do that for you. They cannot help you to discern truth from error. God's Word does because it provides a grid for you to strain everything through. And if it's not found in the Word of God, why would I believe it? If it's not found in Scripture, why would I hold fast to it? So he tells us that it's sure, making wise the simple. Verse 8, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So statutes are guidelines. They're guidelines for conduct. So he's saying the Bible gives us principles for godly living. The statutes of the Lord are right. That word right is a word that is, is used not as being opposed to that which is wrong, but it's right in that it shows you the proper path. It shows you what is correct. Psalm 33, 4 says, The word of the Lord is right. It shows you what is correct. All his works are done in truth. And so by walking in his path, you learn to live and experience joy that comes from God. That's why Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found, I did eat them, your word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I ate your word. It gave to me an enlightenment. It gave to me a joy. I enjoy reading the word of God because it gives to me the correct path to take so that I don't fall into failure and evil. Notice he says, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. I want you to notice when he says the commandment, the Bible is not a book of suggestions. Like Jesus didn't say, you know, it'd be kind of neat if you would believe in me, you know. But if you don't, well, that's cool, too, you know. There's so many others out there, Buddha, Muhammad, what the heck, you know. But for me, it'd be kind of good. No, it's not that way. God didn't say, you, you know, it, it would be cool if you didn't murder, you know. And, and by the way, it'd be, it'd be really, I, I think it'd be great if you, if you didn't commit adultery. No, he said, thou shalt not. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal commandments and that's what he's speaking about so it's not a book of suggestions but the Bible tells us in Proverbs 7 verse 2 if we keep his commandments we will live and we are to keep his law as the apple of our eye so the commandment of the Lord he says is pure enlightening the eyes the word pure speaks of that which is clear and that's interesting because it's a way of saying it is not confusing when it speaks of enlightening it means it provides light for us it illuminates us Psalm 119, 130 says, The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And so as you get into the Word of God, your eyes are opened up to what truth is. Verse 9, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. When he speaks of the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is that which compels us to worship Him. God's Word is intended to communicate His holiness to us, which causes us to bow our knee before Him. So the fear of the Lord is something that actually leads to life. And He says it's clean because there's a purity to it. And God's judgments are true and righteous altogether. In other words, when God makes a judgment, He does it in a fair fashion. When God makes a judgment, it will always be a fair decision. You need to keep that in mind. I was speaking to somebody recently, though this is a conversation that I've had many times. 
and somebody was asking a question concerning a loved one who had recently, had recently died. And they began to share with me a few of the details of this person's life and all, and without going into details, they were concerned for their eternity. And they asked me, what do you think? Did they go to heaven? My answer is always the same. I'm reminded of what uh, Abraham said to God when God was speaking to him and, and when God was telling Abram that he was going to be going into Sodom and, and Gomorrah and those cities surrounding and that he was going to bring judgment. And, uh, and Abram was concerned because his nephew Lot was there with his wife and their children and all, and, and he was concerned. And so he began to speak to the Lord God concerning, uh, well, what if there are 50 righteous? What if there are 40, 30, 20? What if there are 10 righteous? But as he was speaking to the Lord and all, actually asking the Lord to, 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 um, to save Lot and all, um, he said something that, that, that God placed in my heart a long time ago where he said this to, to the Lord. He said, shall not the judge of the earth do right? Shall not the judge of the earth do right? And the answer is yes. God will always do that which is right. Now, he will always judge righteously. He can't be bribed. He can't be talked out of. He only does what is right because God is righteous, you see. And that's what he's saying here. Now, in verse 10, going on, he says, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine or pure gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Now, I find this interesting. He's saying, and I want you to see this, and I know that this is something that, uh, you know, if we're honest, we'll say, I don't think I've gotten there yet. He's saying God's word is to be more desired than gold, fine or pure gold. And in terms of, of the taste of God's word, it's sweeter than honey. What are you saying? Well, this is convicting. Maybe I shouldn't say it because it makes me feel bad. But it's true. I've said this before. I was, it was an illustration given to me um, that really got me, and I, and I think of it often. Pastor Chuck said, if I knew for sure where a gold mine is that is ready to be taken. If he, he said this at a pastor's conference, and he said, listen, man, if I were to say to you, it's got multiple billions of dollars worth of gold, multiple billion. It just so happens that I was given the location. It's mine to give, but I have to get up tomorrow at 3 in the morning, and I'm going to go to this mine. I'm going to begin mining, and any of you who are willing to get up and go with me, I will give to you great portions of wealth from what has been given to me. He said, how many do you think would, of you guys would be up tomorrow at three? Most of you wouldn't even go to bed. You'd be sitting there with your little pickaxe and your shovel in your, in your four by four waiting to go. There's no doubt about it. And that's true. That is, that's, that's true. Billions of dollars in gold you're going to share with me that I can walk away with hundreds of millions of dollars and all I have to do is go with you and, and do a little work and get some? Yep, you know, and that's the truth. That's the point he's making. He's saying that God's word is to be greater desired than gold even if it's the purest of all. Why is that? Because if I'm wealthy, that doesn't mean I go to heaven. I could be a multi-billionaire and I can still perish and go to hell. He said, you need to have a desire for God's word the way that you would have a desire for fine gold. Now, you want to know something? That falls on deaf ears by and large. It really does because we have, we have really, I think many of us have, I, I have failed to value God's word to that degree. It's just like, you know, yeah, right, you know, that's your opinion really, you know. I had a question asked of me just recently. I'm going to be addressing it personally when the person talks to me. It was actually an email question, and I'll be speaking to the person if they show up to speak to me this next Sunday about it. But they said that uh, one of their relatives is reading the Word of God, and the Scripture says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and therefore they thought, well, all Scripture, does that include the Hindu writings, and does that include you know, the Muslim writings and all? Is that all Scripture? Well, the answer to that question is no. God isn't saying that everything that's ever been written that says God in it is inspired by him. What it's speaking about is the word of God. The word of God is inspired by him. And he's saying to us, listen, if you keep the word of God in your heart, if you desire it the way that you would desire gold, if you desire it to eat it like you would want something fresh and sweet like honey from a honeycomb, 
He says, in that desire, you're going to be warned, and there's a great reward in keeping that. Because as you take hold of the Word of God, your life is going to be radically transformed forever. That's why Jeremiah in Jeremiah 15, 16 said, your words were found and I ate them. We are warned by the Word of God. Notice verse 11. That word warned speaks of enlightened through a word of caution. So in holding fast to God's Word, you're going to be kept in the right way of the Lord. And in holding fast to the Word of God, there is a great reward. He goes on in verse 12 and he says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now we'll close with verses 12 through 14 by just touching on them very basically. But notice verse 12, who can understand his errors? Who can understand? He says, cleanse me from secret faults. One of the things that God's Word does is it clarifies for us the error of our life. And for a person who wants to serve the Lord, the Word of God is a tremendous blessing because it reveals secret faults that we might not think are any real problem whatsoever. Some people have sins that they don't even recognize as being sinful. Some people do things. And I'll, I'll give you one of the most basic illustrations is this one. I, and I know this after years of, of serving in this ministry, I can tell you this. Some people don't even realize that what they're doing is wrong. I have had people in our church who have, who have spoken concerning their husbands and and they'll say well my husband this and my my kid that and I've talked to them and and they'll share their hearts with me and all and we'll be talking and uh, then later on when I talk to them again I discover they're not even married to the guy that they're calling their husband a, a lot of people today and I've found I found this to be true and so have you I'm sure when they're living with somebody even if they're, they're not married, they'll, they'll call them their fiancé because they think the word fiancé makes their shacking up okay. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they're living with a guy. They don't want to say the shacking, so that's my fiancé. So they use a French word. Now, <laughs> now maybe the word fiancé means my shack up. I don't know, but maybe that's a literal translation. You know, but that's what you hear. Am I talking to myself? No, that's, that's true. That's true, and, and I hear that. And, and, and you want to know, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes they really don't think there's anything wrong with it. I mean, if they did, do you think they'd tell the pastor? No, because when people speak to the pastor, normally they want me to think that they have little wings in the back and halos. You know, they want me to think they're better than they are, normally. Very few people come up and honestly speak to me. And most of the time they'll come up and they'll, you know, they always want to look a little bit better and all of that. I understand that. But no, they wouldn't, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't tell me, oh, you know, I'm shagging with this guy. No, they say, well, my husband. And so when you speak to them, you say, how long have you been married? <laughs> you know, just wondering, you know. Sometimes, sometimes when we're having baby dedications, sometimes the mama who is not married to the, to the father wants to bring the guy up, and we say, no, you're not married. The only person that I know has any real responsibility to raise this child is the mama because you're the one who's got the baby every day. And so what we'll do is we'll pray for you because you want to do the right thing by that baby. But by bringing up the guy who's maybe the father and maybe biologically involved as a father and maybe even be there right now, well, we don't know where he's going to be five years from now. We don't know if he's going to meet some gal down, you know, a couple months from now and say adios to you and to the baby and go move to Wisconsin, you know. But I know that you're going to be with that baby, and so we'll pray for you. You know, some people think that's cruel. Some people think, oh, that's unfair. But how harsh, how cruel to the baby. No, 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 that's, that's the right thing to do. That's the proper thing to do. But see, a lot of people don't understand that, and so they get upset. You know, when I mentioned, when I, when I had the most uh, very sorrowful, as all of you know, the sorrowful announcement that I made about my, my own daughter, 
you know, becoming pregnant out of wedlock and all, and I shared with a broken heart to this congregation, uh, one of the members of this church, or actually a visitor, and I don't know that they've ever returned, but he came back to me, was upset at me because they said, well, you know, he's blaming that baby and how can, he's not accepting the baby. That's not true at all. It's never been. It's never been true. What I was concerned about was the fact that there was sin involved and my daughter needed to do what was right before God. But some people don't understand that. They think, how cruel, you're self-righteous, you're judgmental. And even as they're judging me for being judgmental. And I find that interesting. I find that interesting. But the bottom line is, we don't understand. That's why we put birth announcements. Joe Smith and, and Darla Jones gave birth. And we're proud of that now. And we don't think there's anything wrong with it. That's why the mayor of San Francisco says he's doing the morally right thing by performing marriages for homosexuals. He believes what he's doing is the right thing. And when you get away from the Word of God, anything that's right in your own eyes is going to be justifiable. That's how it works. And they say we're in an act of civil disobedience. Yet I don't see anybody getting bitten by dogs. I don't see anybody with with you uh, getting hooked up and dragged away and put in a paddy wagon and spending the night in any jail. I don't see that at all. And what we have right now is a radical move to overthrow the tradition of marriage that society and civilization has always honored since the inception of man, woman being together. And yet they say we're doing this because these people honestly think that what they're doing is right. And yet the Word of God says no. We need to be cleansed from secret faults, from things that we don't even know are wrong. And that's what the Word of God does. Listen, when the Word of God is rightly divided and you are seated out there listening in a Bible study or when you're at home just reading the Word and praying and saying, Lord, what are you saying? Your heart is opened up. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews in chapter 4, verse 12, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So you're reading it and you say, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. I have secret faults. And when he speaks in verse 13 of presumptuous sins, it's sins that I decide to go out and do anyway, even though I know better. That's why he says, keep your servant also from presumptuous sins. So somebody says, well, I'm just lonely and I want to go out and I'm going to go dancing and if I find a gal there, I'll take her home because, you know, God understands I'm a man of flesh and I have needs. He says, keep back, from, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord my strength, and my Redeemer. May I meditate on the things that produce words that please you and honor you. Even as the heavens declare your glory, may I also declare your glory. So may the words of my mouth and may the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. The one who gives me strength and the one who bought me, I want to honor you.